Hi, everyone. In this presentation, what I want to do is kind of go over the basics of taking an ecological approach to rowing. So I'm going to talk about the basics of the ecological approach and bring in some rowing research that I fit, think fits well. So the ecological approach is a new, newer way to look at skill acquisition, motor learning, skill development. I, uh, this is a book I wrote that kind of introduces the basic concepts and the basic ideas. Um, what I want to do is kind of expand on that specifically to rowing today. So it's a new kind of increasingly popular way to look at skill. And the way I want to look at this, and I, I want to contrast this to kind of the more traditional way we have looked at skill acquisition and skill development in the past. And the way I want to look at this is by looking at, starting by looking at variability. So variability, how much things change, either between the differences between two elite performers, the differences the same performer every time they execute the same movement, right? So the ba for, there's basically three types of variability we wanna consider. The first is the variability in the performance outcome, right? So how consistently do you pr produce the performance outcome you want? In rowing, how consistently do you produce the when, you know, the top speed? How pr consistently are you your whole crew in synchrony, right? Um, so in, in basketball, how consistently do you get in the ball in the hoop? So we want this to be low, right? We want consistent performance outcomes. Good. The real crux of the matter is how we get there, right? The second type of variability is movement variability. So what we're talking about here is the angles and the forces and the positions of your joints you use to produce a certain outcome, right? So when you're rowing, when you do the catch phase or shift towards the recovery phase, what is the angle of your knee? What is the angle of your elbow? Um, how variable is that? Is that the same for every elite performer? Do they all have a 30 degree knee angle or whatever? Is it the same across uh, strokes, right? Do you always produce the same knee angle, right? So movement variability. What we're gonna see is this is the big difference where between the two theories of, of motor learning and skill acquisition. And finally, we have variability of practice. How variable are the practice conditions? Is the person pra always practicing under the same restricted conditions, for example, using a rowing machine? Or are they practicing out in the wind, using different boats, different oars, et cetera, right? So variability of practice. What we're gonna look at is a relationship between two, these three things, right? And the traditional approach to skill acquisition is the idea of the, uh, the one correct technique, right? There's one, kind of ideal rowing technique. You know, body positions, when to shift, when when your oar should go in the water, right? And we go to a coach, the instructor, and they give us this solution, right? They teach us this ideal technique. Um, what they do is we do this through repetition, right? So we practice the stroke over and over and over again under very restricted conditions. The coach gives us feedback and correction. No, you're extending your legs too early. Right? They're usually very internally focused cues. We're talking about what your body's doing, right? And the basic assumption, right, is, I think, uh, is the assumption, I'll, I'll emphasize this a few times, is that any kind of movement variability is bad, right? So if you're on one stroke, your knee angle is this, on another stroke, your knee angle is slightly bigger, another is slightly smaller, that's bad. We don't want that, right? We want you to row like a robot, right? Your same exact body movements for the stroke, every single stroke, right? And so any movement variability is considered to be noise, right? It's essentially uh, inconsistency, like what we expect of a novice. And what we're going to do is make you repeat it over and over and correct you over and over until you get rid of it, right? So the assumption is here, what we want, the key to the movement outcome, right? The movement outcome we want is to have be fast, be in sync, be efficient with our, our energy level. The way that we achieve that is by having a particular technique that's repeatable, right? We we have the same angle of our knees when we go on the, the this stroke, right? And what we're going to do on mechanic in in practice is that, so we're gonna, we want so low we're going to have very very low practice variability. We're going to practice under very restricted conditions like using a machine till you get you learn this technique. We're going to get you to repeat it over and over to get rid of this movement variability, which is a bad thing. So the assumption in traditional motor learning is that low outcome variability, consistently good outcomes, which is what we want, is produced by low movement variability, by having the exact same repeatable technique. 
And this is developed by starting at least in low practice variability under conditions very restricted, the same conditions. We're gonna take you out of the water because that's too chaotic and too variable. We're gonna put you in very restricted conditions until you get your technique down, right? You're gonna repetition, right? So, so this is assumption I just said, movement variability is unfunctional noise. We want to reduce as much as possible by having the athlete repeat the movement over and over. And I could give you lots of quotes. There's lots in my book about the, how important people think, right? This is John Wooden, the famous basketball coach. His, his quote is, the eight laws of learning are explanation, demonstration, imitation, repetition, 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 repetition. So for a long time, we've had this belief that the key to becoming skillful is repeating the same movement. So you do the same basketball shot from the same distance, the same position, no defender over and over and over again until you can do it exactly the same way every time. That's the goal of practice. Right? That's the tradition. That has long been the traditional stuff, assumption. It still guides a lot of what we do, right? When we add variability in, right? When we add variability in, right? We make you row in rough water or make you row in the wind or make you row in a different boat or with different number of team members. What we're looking for is we're looking for you to make adjustments off this ideal form, right? So we want to develop the ideal technique first, right? That's why things like in soccer, we're going to make you dribble around cones first, right? Because we want to develop the ideal dribbling technique before we put a player in front of you. You have to make adjustments. So, and this is the fit with the, the dominant um, concept in the, this traditional approach, the idea of the motor program. You have this stored information, you program in your head for this movement that tells every muscle what they should be doing at any moment, right? And you develop that through repetition. So the goal of, of variability is adjustability. We wanna be able to repeat the movement, repeat the outcome by repeating the movement despite variations in our environment, okay? And that's what we're, we're looking for. And so this is, as I said, this is the traditional view that's dominated for a long, long time, right? So what we want to do is we want to add variability later on, right? So we would never teach, this is a baseball example, right? We would never teach someone how to vary, uh, a novice how to ro either do rowing or do um, a baseball swing under very variable conditions, right? In rough waters or with different sized boats all the time or with really di difficult pitchers, right? Because they need to learn the quote unquote fundamentals of the swing or rowing technique first. Then later on, we'll teach them how to make adjustments, right? For, you know, different conditions. Like think about golf. You, you spend hours and hours of practicing on a flat ground and then we'll teach you how to hit on the downhill. The adjustments you have to make to hit on a downhill or an uphill or out of the sand, et cetera. Right, so as I said, this is a traditional view. One of the things we're going to do, we're going to do when we have a novice to make things simpler, we're going to decompose the task. What we're going to do is we're going to take the skill out of context, out of the, the actual competition context. So we can take the rowing and take it out of the water and put it on the machine, right? Because what we want you to do is learn the fundamentals of the movement. What we're doing here really is we're separating perception and action, right? So you perceive information about the water, about the conditions, about the other boats, that's all gone right here. We're just focusing on the technique, okay? So that's kind of the the, the basic approach we use, right? So that's, the, as I said, the traditional, hopefully it sounds fairly familiar. The alternative ecological approach, right? So the alternative ecological approach started with a Russian, we traced back to a Russian physiologist named Nikolai Bernstein. And the idea is that there's not one ideal technique, right? There is an ideal optimal technique for each individual that depends on their own individual, the word we're going to use is constraints, their height, their leg length, their flexibility, right? And they are going to, this is going to uh, come out through a process of self-organization, which means you're essentially, your body is going to find the best solution itself without the coach telling you exactly what to do. We're going to give less feedback and correction. And we're going to give, um, we're going to have this very important concept introduced by Bernstein called repetition without repetition. Bernstein, one of the first things he studied was blacksmiths. And this is a, a tray showing two a hammer swings by a blacksmith. What you can see is they're not exactly the same. Bernstein came up with a fundamental idea is that in order to repeat an outcome, hitting the, the sheet metal in the same spot, doing getting the same asynchronous rowing stroke, you can't repeat the movement because the conditions around you are, and, and inside you are always changing. 
when I'm fatigued, the same force on the rower, pull on the rower is not going to cause the same outcome. So I have to change. I have to be adapt. So I need variability I have to, without repetition. You can't reproduce the same movement. So Bernstein's view, movement variability was a good thing, right? Because it allows us to adapt to the conditions, right? Something sometimes called motor redundancy or motor abundance, right? So ecological approach, right? In order to achieve consistent outcomes, consistent speed in the boat, synchronous between teammates, efficiency, we, we can't do that by doing the exact same stroke mechanics every time because the conditions are changing. The weather's changing. The wind's changing. We're getting fatigued. We got a, we're closer to the boys. We have different boats. We have different teammates, et cetera, so on. Their teammates, even if we have the same teammates, they're, chain, they're getting fatigued, so on. We have, so in order to repeat the outcome, we can't repeat the move, exact same movement. We have to learn to adapt our movement to the conditions we're or the constraints and conditions we're faced with. And we the best way to achieve this in the ecological approach is much more variability in practice, right? So varying oar length, shape, size, boat size, weather conditions. By giving people experience, we want athletes to become adaptable. We train them to be adaptable, not robots that produce the same movement over and over that they learn through repeating it over and over, right? So the idea, low outcome movement variability requires a significant amount of movement variability to adapt to the conditions, which is developed by higher practice variability. That's the fundamental idea of the ecological approach. So movement variability is functional. It allows us to adapt to the ever-changing constraints, the things we're facing both from the outside, changes in our competition, weather, et cetera, so on, and from the inside, fatigue, we maybe we tweaked a muscle, maybe we're sore from weightlifting the other the, the day before, right? So we constantly have to adapt. We're never performing under the same conditions twice, right? So we need to be able to adapt our movement to in response to that. That's the ecological approach. So what we're considering in this, and we'll, this will be important when we talk about, we'll talk a little bit about teamwork and coordination in, in rowing at the end. This is important because yeah, what we're going to do is consider the athlete is what's called a complex adaptive system. So the athlete is faced, they have the, a bunch of these bunch of constraints. They have individual constraints, their body size, their weight, their level of motivation, their level of fatigue, environmental constraints, wind, weather, et cetera, task constraints, how long's the course, how, what's the stroke rate we're going for. And from this is going to emerge a, a movement solution that's the best for them. Right. And it's not going to be the same every time because these things are changing all the time. Right. They're adapt people. What we want in an athlete is not automatic uh, robot like movement patterns. We want adaptive movement patterns. Right. That's kind of what we're looking for. OK. So the reason we're adding variability is we're encouraging adaptability. We're encouraging you to learn to pick up information from your environment and then adjust your movements accordingly. We want repetition without repetition because so we're learning to learn to move. Okay? Um, so variability, we want variability much, much earlier, right? We don't want you, we don't want you to learn that there's no such thing as the fundamentals, right? There's no such thing as the correct rowing technique because it depends on the situation. There's so many factors, so many constraints. We want you to learn right from the beginning to be able to adapt it. Okay? That's the ecological approach. Okay. So instead of, of, of when we want to have a new learner and we want to sympathize, sympathize, apply things, instead of decomposing it, right, taking the boat out of the water, what we want to do is simplify, right? So this is a study showing um, kind of uh, the force for different stroke rates uh, of different skill levels, right? I think there's three different skill levels you can see. That as you force get a higher stroke rate, you're, it's causing a big problem for novices. So one thing we could do with novices is a lower stroke rate or a wider boat that's more controllable, right? So we're not separating the boat from the water. We're changing the other constraints to simplify it for them, to make it easier for them, right? And the oar length, whatever might the case might be, Let, let's have them in good weather conditions, right? So we still want to keep the task whole. So they're still perceiving the water, perceiving the thing around them. They're still acting according to that. We're not separating that by putting them on a rowing machine. Okay? So we have information that's based on information from the water. We're keeping, the word we use is coupled. We're keeping perception and action together. Right? We're not breaking them apart. Okay, 
So that's the basic kind of differences between the two approach. Now, how do we put this into practice? And I'm gonna talk about kind of two different methods and some research. Um, one of them is called the constraint sled approach, another one called differential learning. Okay. So let's talk, let's talk about how we typically uh, co correct a technical flaw as a rowing coach, right? So imagine a common technical flaw, you know, this, I'm not a huge rowing expert, but this is, you know, from what I know about rowing and a little bit, missing the catch is a very common technical flaw. So the, the oar not being in the correct position when you start your leg drive, right? You're not getting it fully in the water. You're not, you, you know, the, you can do biomechanical analysis show that this is not efficient. So, so this is a flaw because it, it's not efficient. We're not transferring force effectively. It's not, we're not, remember, notice we're not saying it's a flaw because this angle is wrong or something like that. We have a, a functional reason, right? How do we typically correct that, right? So typically what we're going to do is have a coach beside you, right, giving you lots of instructions about how to correct it. Lift your hands, push your hands, get over your body, do this with your legs, right? So what we're doing is we're essentially, we're, as a coach, we're giving the athlete the solution, right? We're telling them, Here's what you need to do to correct this problem, right? And we're doing it through lots of explicit instruction, telling them what they need to do, and a very internal, we're focusing on their body, right? In general, what is the problem with this? What is the problem with this? Okay, the first problem with this is when you refer to an athlete's body a lot, do this with your hands, do this with your legs, so on, you induce what's called a, an internal focus of attention. Right, so I'll come back to this in a second. An internal focus of attention is when your attention is directed to the movement or the position of your body during the execution of your your, your skill. Right, keep your feet, flex your knees, bend your wrists, so on. We're getting you to focus on the actual movement itself. The alternative, what's called an external focus of attention, is getting you to focus on the effect your movement has on the environment. Listen to the sound of the oar hitting the water. Right, that's an internal focus. That's not on your body. That's the effect your, your movement is having on the environment, the water, right? So, and it can be the object you're holding or something more distant, right? So these are two, the kind of two extremes. And the article I have here, here's a, um, a meta-analysis looking, this has been a very, very well-studied effect uh, led by a person named Gabby Wolf at University of Nevada, Las Vegas, who started it and done a lot of the research showing consistently that external focus of attention is better for both learning and performance, right? When we get you to focus externally on, away from your body, you perform better, right? When we get you to think about all your mechanics and your technique, you can become very robotic and unathletic, right? We don't want you thinking about what your knee is doing while you're in a rowing, right? That just gets you, that's, there's tons of research showing that's in less effective. And there's some actual research in rowing. Right, here's a, star, a study looking at comparing one group that was uh, coached. So you can see all the instructions they've got, right? Uh, lower your hands, focus on your hands, focus, uh, you know, so a lot of reference to the body, legs, so on, versus uh, look at the oar, look at the blade, focus on the blade, focus on where the boat is going, right? So those are all external instructions, getting to focus on something in environment. Right. And what they did in this, this study was they put two groups and they compared them and they looked at um, the time to uh, lock a couple measures of performance time to lock and maximum reach to lock distance. Right. And what they found was the endpoint consistently led to better performance. Right. And that is shown in multiple sports, multiple different activities. Focusing externally leads to better performance and they not shown in this study, better learning in the long run. So that's one of the problems with kind of the traditional way we correct technique. The other problem is that even, there's some good research showing um, that even very, very skilled performers have a very difficult time implementing technical corrections. When you say, bend your knee 10 a little more, extend your arm a bit further, right? People are not, don't have awareness of those things very well while they're doing their, their movement. And this is one of my favorite quotes from one of my colleagues from Bosch. The body shows very little interest in what the coach has to say, okay? Our body is designed to organize, self-organize itself, like, the, the, like a flock of birds, right? They form this pattern on their own. There's no boss telling them each what boss. 
what to do. Not to, it's not designed to be bossed around, telling it either you or your coach saying bend a little more. Right, and this is a good study looking at tennis, where they did basically they use motion tracking and they had people that coaches telling tennis players bend your knees 10 degrees more or hit the ball 20 centimeters further in front. And what they showed in this study is even elite tennis players can't do this consistently. Right? They can't take that instruction on board and adopt it, right? It's too, they don't have that level of awareness and control over their movement to do that. They can't boss their body around while they're serving like that, okay? The other kind of problem with this is the ideal solution in correcting, right, is not addressing that thing I talked about earlier, the individual constraints and something we talked about, we talk about an ecological approach called intrinsic dynamics, which is your kind of ten, your preferred coordination, both in your body, your individual constraints, your body dimensions, how tall are you? How long is your legs relative to your arms? What's your wingspan, right? All of these things are going to change the rowing technique that's going to work best for you, right? So forcing a one size fits all solution onto everybody is not going to be effective, right? An effective approach. And also, you know, we're not, we, we're ignoring, right? If we're going to stand there and correct <coughs> and give you the same, the technique, no, you're extending too far. We're, we're squashing the very important role that m this functional role movement variability plays within a performer. So let's look at that. I want to show you a couple of studies that show, show this, right? So here's a study looking at the, um, the stroke for uh, different, uh, going at different speeds. And this is a measure of the variability of knee and ankle angle, right? So this um, during different parts of the rowing cycle, what you can see is that certain parts of the rowing cycle, there's, there's, there's quite large, right? So there's not zero variability, right? You're not, the idea that you're producing the same stroke ang angle, knee and ankle angle, every stroke is a myth, right? We don't do that, right? There's significant amounts of variability. There's significant differences in variability as you increase the stroke rate. Right. So um, here's a, another one showing another angle. Right. Those. So there's lots of evidence for this. So these studies show there's a significant and these were elite rowers, significant amount of stroke to stroke movement variability. Right? You don't produce exactly the same stroke every time, even in elite rowers. There's evidence that it's functional. Right? You're changing your stroke some way in order to adapt to a higher stroke rate. Um, so you're getting better performance. You're getting that repetition without repetition we want. And there's also this evidence, and I'll, I'll talk more about this in a little bit, that this could reduce injury. This actually plays a functional role in reducing injury. And why is that the case, right? If you think about it, repeating the exact same movement with the exact same muscles, same tendons, over and over and over, is going to overstress your body, right? And increase the stress on your body. And there's this hypothesis by a person named James called the variability overuse injury hypothesis. If you think about injury, typically we talk about two things, the amount of load and the, the, um, the amount and how often, right? So the frequency and load, um, how often do you lift, you know, how much? And now James proposes a third dimension, variability, right? If we're doing it in the same way every time, we're going to increase the chance you're going to get injury, injured too. So those variability in ankle, and ankle knee ang angles and things we, that study was showing, um, not only are they been, seem to be a beneficial perfor performance, allowing you to maintain your stroke at a higher rate, but they also seem to preserve an injury prevention mechanism and, I'll, and I'll, a function. I'll show you evidence of that in a second. Okay, Here's another slightly more tricky way to understand uh, evidence of, of movement variability. Okay, um, So movement, if you think about it, if in the traditional view, any variability in from stroke to stroke in your knee angle, your elbow angle is just noise, right? It should be just random, right? So if I took your, looked at your, your variability from stroke to stroke to stroke, it should be completely random, right? And the way that we can describe that in, in, in the, the approach we use dynamical systems, it should be what's called white noise. White noise is what you see on your TV late at night when you have all snow on your screen. It's also when you have something tuned in to a station that's not there. What that means is there's equal strength at all frequencies, right? That means that there's no pattern, observable pattern at all, right? 
So in this study, they did a really interesting thing. So white noise means there's equal strength at all the frequencies. So low pitch, like low sounds. And if you think about it in terms of auditory signal, low sounds are just as high as high sounds. That's why you hear shh. It's all frequencies added together. Pink noise is when there's stronger, the, the strength goes down as the frequency goes up, right? The amplitude. So what's going, what's showing there is that it's not just completely random. There's some pattern to the variability in, in the rowing stroke, right? There's some pattern as we go across that it's not just noise, it's functional, right? And this is what they found in this study. So this is white noise, right? Where all the frequencies are equal. This is pink noise where they're, they're, you're, you're, you're not producing the same stroke to stroke, but there's a correlation between what's going on. And uh, this is showing uh, this, these five rowers were um, lesser skilled, lower skilled. These were uh, high skilled rowers. What you can see is um, high skilled rowers show evidence of this pink noise, this functional correlated variability, whereas uh, lesser skilled ones don't, right? And I should mention, um, if you want to understand the, the what pink noise and white noise, and you can learn about brown noise too, um, the, uh, there's an episode I have on my podcast number 348 where I go in detail about that. Okay, so, but it's more evidence to show that there's one, there's movement variability and you're not producing the same rowing stroke over and over like a robot would do. It's You're varying from stroke to stroke in the body angles, the positions, things like that. And it's functional, right? It's not just noise. It's not, it has a purpose, right? And we don't want to squash that, okay? So let's get into the methods, right? So the alternative to this kind of traditional way of explicitly instructing and correcting a movement for all is to use what's something called the constraints-led approach, right? So the constraints-led approach, what we want to do is instead of trying to correct someone's movement solution, Right, to say, okay, try pushing your hands more forward before you, you know, putting, doing this before your leg drive or bending the knees more or whatever it is, right? What we want to do is think about what constraint can we add to the environment or change in the environment that will push the person to find a new movement solution closer to what we want, right? So in rowing, that can be anything, right? So I don't have, there's, there's not a lot of ton, ton of examples in the research I could find of people doing this. Right, so it's changing the oar, the mass, the length, the blade, the boat, the number of crew members, the targets hanging off the boat, the stroke rate, the distance you're going to stroke, going to go. The fatigue, you can make the person pre-fatigue. You can change the environment, wind, water. Right, so these are all constraints. Right, things that a person needs to adapt to. In the constraints-led approach, what we're going to do is manipulate one or more of these in a very specific way to try to. A change. So if you know, if you wanted to change a, a rowing stroke, for example, you could have a target hanging off the boat that you had to hit every time, right? Before you put the the oar in the water, right? What that's doing is essentially it's making your old movement solution of putting it in too early, for example, not possible anymore. You won't be able to achieve this kind of task, right? Um, we want so the idea of the constraint set approach is: can we add something that's going to push you away from what you're doing now? and find something new without telling you all the details of what that new thing is, right? And in my book, we use this in baseball a lot. For example, with baseball pitchers, we have a common thing where their arm is separating from their body too early, which is kind of cause of injury. What we do is we put a ball under their arm called a connection ball, and we tell them throw so the ball goes, the connection ball goes forward. We don't tell them how to do that. We don't tell them anything about the new movement pattern, we've just added this constraint that kind of makes it so separating from your body too early won't work and they have to try something new. And the fundamental idea of the constraints that approach and is what we're doing is we're giving athletes a new problem to solve, right? We're giving them a movement problem to solve. Row with this shorter oar, row with this longer oar, row with uh, while you're fatigued, row under these conditions. We're not, and figure it out on your own. We're not, and, and we can, a coach, we can push it around and guide it a little bit. We're not giving them the solution. We're not telling them, bend your arm like this, do this. Right? We're, that's the fundamental idea of the constraints that approach. And there's quite a lot of research in um, if everything from weightlifting to baseball to soccer. There's a lot of research showing the benefits of this over this explicit instruction, okay? 
And this is something, right? The fundamental idea here is this idea of creating movement problems for an athlete. And they don't have to be the same as the one they're going to face in competition. So you might say to me, Rob, why would I ever want an athlete to practice rowing with a different boat or a different oar than they're going to use in their competition, right? The reason that's beneficial is because learning to adjust your movement pattern to, co to compensate for that change in constraints is valuable, right? It makes you an adaptable athlete. It's the same thing you're going to have to do when it gets really windy out. There's a crosswind versus a headwind, right? What we're not trying in practice, we're not trying to drill into you this one movement pattern for this one oar or this one boat. We're not trying to get that. We're not trying to teach you this one motor program in your head. We're trying to teach you be adaptive problem solver, right? So having conditions and practice that are very different than they're going to face in, co in competition, as long as they're chosen, as long as all the same key things are there, the information they're picking up from the water, the basic dynamics of the rowing pattern, then that's fine. That can be very, very effective. So for example, in, in baseball, I have baseball pitchers throw a heavier ball than normal, a bigger ball than normal. Because the process of them learning how to control that ball is very, very valuable, even though they're never, ever going to be asked to throw a heavier or bigger ball in a game, right? The process of adapting to these new problems we're creating for them is very, very valuable. And that's the instance of the constraints-led approach, okay? Um, the other thing we can do in the constraints-led approach is we can amplify information. We can make... Um, the information you're getting from the environment about the water, about your stroke, um, stronger, right? So you can learn to pick up, right? What you want the athlete to do, and what we'll talk about team coordination, et cetera, is we, you want the athlete to learn, you want the athlete to know when they get fatigued, right? Before the coach yells at them, you, you, ideally you want them to be able to recognize from the information they're getting from the environment both the feel, the kinesthetic proprioceptive information, the sound of the water or hitting the water, that they're slowing their stroke rate down, right? You want them to pick up that on their own, be able to adapt their movement, right? Here's a, a couple of studies that were they're doing literal amplification, right? So one of the things that I have to talk about in this episode, 350, one of the tools we really like is movement sonification, right? So can we take your movement, add a sound to it to give you more feedback about, you know, the these kind of parameters. And again, well, the key thing is we're letting you make adjustments and self-organize. We're not telling you what to do. So that's another kind of key component, this idea of amplifying information. You know, the in, for example, in sports like basketball and soccer, one of the things we use is what's called a small-sided game, right? So instead of playing on a regular soccer field, we make a super small soccer field, right? Because the information you're going to get about spacing and what happens if I do this is much more, much more, much amplified compared to on a big field. So there's much more space. So that's the basic idea here. Okay. So that's constraints led approach. The other approach that we use in, in the ecological approach is called differential learning. Differential learning is when we're going to essentially just add a lot of variability and we're going to get you to kind of experience this. The fundamental idea of differential learning is we don't want you to move the same way every time twice. So what we would, the idea is you're going to learn about the movement space, the, all the possible ways you can move by experiencing all these different conditions, right? So, you know, in differential learning, closing one eye, right? Starting with the oar and starting from a different position, different size or different equipment, right? So these are the fundamental ideas. There's lots of research showing the benefits of this, right? Um, so that's another approach you can use. So you could have a, a, a team practice with different oars, different start positions, different things, just to get that experience of kind of the different ways they can move. Okay? And as I mentioned, I just wanted to show this before getting uh, to team coordination. This is a study looking at the potential injury benefits, right? So this was in soccer. So what they did in the study is they took uh, soccer novices and before it, they did have them do change of direction tests. So they had to run, stop, come back. And what they were doing, they motion tracked them and they, they measured markers of ACL injury. So basically how, what was your knee angle? What was your, the forces you were generating on the ground when you made the turn, right? And so they, they identified it and they have clear ones they know are related to knee injury. So they measured this before training. 
Then what they did is they didn't cha- train you in that change of direction test. They trained you in soccer. So what they did was they had three groups. One group was had very, very traditional coaching where they're given instructions. So they're trying to teach the athlete to do the same thing every time, right? We're trying to teach you to dribble and then by doing, use the inside of your foot, do this with your leg. We want to reduce variability. Then they had also had a constraint side approach where they use small sided games, lots of manipulation of constraints to have you adaptable and a differential learning approach where they actually had you dip, move differently on every execution. So these two are encouraging you to move in different ways. This one is not, it's squashing that, okay? And what do they find? They, at, then after this training, they did the change of direction test. And what they found were, this is looking at the force. So this is the traditional approach. The force actually got higher, right? Because you learn, you're moving in the exact same way every time. For the other two methods, you actually get a reduction in the ground reaction force when you're making that cut, right? Because you're learning to do move in slightly different ways every time. You're learning to adapt. So you're not putting the same forces on the same body parts. So they have a few other me- measures, right? And they show these benefits. So one of the other benefits along with adaptability and performance benefits of, of using this ecological approach where we encourage movement variability, we encourage repetition without repetition, seems to be injury prevention, okay? The last thing I want to look at in, in today is um, where I think the ecological approach fits really well with rowing is when we talk about interpersonal coordination, right? So interpersonal coordination is when we have, um, you know, a team of rowers, right? So obviously we want a big part of rowing effectively is being in sync, synchrony, doing the same stroke at the same time, right? So one of the ways we can understand this is instead of just considering an individual athlete as a complex system, um, looking at the team as a complex system, right? So the team is going to, um, they're they're picking up from their teammates, they're going to adapt and their they're stroke based on the information, right? So, so rowing crews uh, uh, have to do have the need to coordinate their action throughout the race and constantly adjust to each other, right? So they're picking up information about their teammates. Like I said, ideally, we don't want to wait until a coach yells at, a, at like, commands and ask, oh, you're dropping behind so-and-so. What we want to do is teach our rowers to pick up on their own when they're becoming out of sync, right? By the information they're picking up from their environment, right? So, and this is very well understood by using kind of a de- dynamical systems um, approach, uh, understanding this coordination in a phenomenon called coupling. So coupling is when my rowing stroke is linked to your rowing stroke, is linked to someone else's, right? That's what we want, right? And uh, ecological approach gives a really nice way to understand this. And here's a really nice paper on this, uh, Frontiers. This is by Ludovic Seifert, who's done a lot of research on ecological approach in a lot of different sports. I'm just going to briefly talk about it, but I'd recommend you, you have a look at it. There's a lot of great stuff in here. This is looking at both kind of coordination in rowing, okay? So the what, what they were going to do is they both looked at kind of the what happened when coordination break down and people's perceptions of what was going on, which uh, I'm not going to go into a ton, but I just want to show you some, some of the highlights, right? So this is showing, this is a measure from uh, dyna, uh, dynamical systems theory, ecological dynamics called relative phase, right? So phase refers to, right, so, you know, as I'm, you know, I'm, I'm propulsing and recovering, you know, what is, so if the, you can divide a, a, a rowing stroke into different parts, where am I relative to you, right? So if you start your stroke and I'm your teammate and I start your stroke slightly after you, I would be slightly out of phase, right? I'd be a little bit behind you in, in the stroke. I did everything else the same. We can measure that that stroke, that difference in terms of a, an angle, right? So nine, uh, 180 degrees out, out of phase would be, well, I'd be, doing the propulsion phase when you are doing the recovery phase. So it would be, which we don't want, obviously. That's exactly the opposite. Well, this is showing um, uh, the through the rowing cycle duration, this is showing um, an international level team. You can see their incredible relative phase is almost around zero the whole time. Okay, so they're, they're doing a great job of staying in phase. So they're, they're hit, doing the same strokes at the same time, parts of the stroke at the same time. This is a national level team. You can see much less effective, right? We're, they're getting out of phase a lot, okay? 
And they showed this. This is a, a measure called the Couchy Index, which is a measure of being in phase and out of phase. And this is this was a two-person crew. Um, this is this is a you can look at both the individual level and the team level, right? So this is the kind of basically you can think of the correlation between two successive strokes, right? So if it's high, it means they're not correlated. It means you've changed something dramatically. And what you can see, this is the black is the bow rower, right? And the gray is the, the stroke, the person, the other person on the crew. And what you can see is there's some, you can see some reactions from the, the stroke rower, right? In response to changes. So even though there's good relative phase, right? Um, and this was, this is again, the international crew. You can see there's not very big differences. This is a national crew. You can see very large differences in the, so the person, you know, as the, the lead rower is getting fatigued, the water's changing, right? They're getting, um, changing their rowing stroke and a good uh, teammate will adjust to that, right? Without having to being told, right? So this coordination, being able to adapt to your environment individually is also going to help you to be able to adapt to your environment as a teammate because you're focusing on picking up information from your environment, whether it's sound, kinesthetic, whatever, to be able to make adjustments, right? So it's all about this adaptability, right? So this is, as I said, is a really interesting paper. I would recommend having a look. Okay. So to kind of end off, I want to talk about, so I've talked about this kind of different view of, of skill, this ecological approach. I want to leave you kind of some take-home messages. How do you bring this into your own practice as a coach? Okay. So the first kind of principle, and this is not unique to the ecological approach, but is really important, is I always start with is ask why, right? So every practice session, you want to be purposeful, right? Um, not, right, you want to have, like, what is the purpose? Is it just for fun? Is it just to make people, my team feel confident? Or is it really some development? You really want to develop the skill, right? What we're going to do is we're going to vary the level of challenge for those things, right? Sometimes you want it to be relatively easy. So people do everything perfectly in practice. Other times, you know, we want things to be really hard and challenging where they're making a, some mistakes because that's when you improve. And within the ecological approach, there's this nice framework we have. We, what we want to do essentially is think about periodizing skill training in the same way we periodize physical training. Like when you're training for a marathon, you do this, long runs, you have a recovery week, right? Um, but what we're going to do, th there's a gr this is a great example of using a periodization framework in uh, in rowing and paddling, actually, um, you can see. You'll have, yeah, I won't go into all the details, but I think it's a great paper showing how you can make the appropriate time to add a lot of variability, to add a lot of challenge. Okay. Um, what we want to do is make second. How can we make practice activities more race-like? Right. Having you know, if I lose synchrony or I lose, I get fatigued. What happens? Right. On a rowing machine, nothing. Right have consequences for action, um, have the athlete make decisions, right? Um, you know, that's important. Add variability to practice conditions. This is the biggest thing, I think, you know, hopefully take home message. Variability in practice conditions is good, right? You obviously have to do it cautiously with a new person, but having a, changing the oar, type of oar, the type of boat, the type of conditions, the length of your rowing, the stroke rate is valuable because it's giving the athlete new problems to solve. We want to present athletes with new problems to solve. We want to step in with re instructions. Actually, instructions is probably the wrong way. We want to step in with a little guidance, right? So try, why don't you try doing this, right? But we want to do much less of that than we do traditionally. We don't want to be constantly talking to the athlete. I actually do, in some of the practices I do, I turn the music up really loud, right? So coaches can't talk as much. If they want to say something, they have to make a huge effort and go right up to them because I don't want them constantly being correcting and telling the athlete what to do. I want the athlete to figure it out on their own. We want to create an environment as a coach where it's okay and expected that the athlete's going to be challenged and they're going to fail sometimes. That's when we learn, when we fail. If we do everything right and perfectly in practice, that's performing, not learning, right? We don't, we need to have at least some of our practices where we're failing and let the athlete find their own movement solution. You know, within, can, within a certain bound, like bandwidth, like obviously you, as a coach, you know what's going to work. 
as a role, right? You know that you have to, there's certain kind of non-negotiables that you have to hit. But within that and between those, there's a lot of room for people to do their own individual style and variation and um, pay, that works best for them based on their own body, their own individual constraints. So I think that's really, really important. Okay, so that's all for today, kind of what I want to say. So this is kind of my shameless promotion to end on. So as I said, if you want to learn kind of the really basics about what this approach is, where it comes from, the advantages, then I wrote this book, How We Learn to Move. I also have a podcast called the Perception Action Podcast, where I go into really deep into the weeds of skill acquisition and a lot of these kind of approaches. I review a lot of research. Um, I interview um, uh, different people and coaches in the field. Um, so if you're interested, uh, please check that out. You can find everything about me. If you want, uh, you can go to perceptionaction.com is the best, best place. You can find all, all of my information. I also have a YouTube channel where I present different things and I talk about these different things. So I appreciate your time and thank you very much for, for, for listening.